so we have started the recording and we are live so we can start whenever everyone is ready yeah i think we are ready now we can start uh, the event should i start sir yeah i think you should start okay good afternoon to one and all present here on behalf of the constitutional law club hilsa school of law jamia hamdard i welcome you all to a national lecture on why constitutional matters for the information of our audience the lecture is a part of series of events we have had since yesterday to celebrate the constitution day at school of law jamia hamdard we are delighted to have with us today advocate karuna nandi as our guest speaker for the lecture advocate karuna nandi has an economic degree from saint stephen's college new delhi university a law degree from university of cambridge and an lm from columbia law school advocate nandi has played a significant role in drafting the anti rape bill after 2012 delhi gang rape she also represented the bhopal gas survivor in the supreme court and got them better healthcare system currently a lawyer at the supreme court she specializes in the constitutional and media law commercial litigation and arbitration and legal policy she regularly appears on national and international news channels and advocate nandi comments on issue of law like free speech and gender it's really an honor to have her with us today and without uh, further ado i would like to request ma'am to deliver the lecture and enlighten us about why constitution matters thank you so much for that sakshi um it's an honor to be here thank you for having me and i am somewhat glad actually that we are doing this a day after the official constitution day um because i think it gives us a bit of space for real reflection and exploration uh with regard to sort of how how we feel and strategies and what we can possibly do to make this constitution a reality um given that most of you are law students i would very much enjoy leaving space for a q and a so i'm going to um i'm going to make my comments and then um and then I, we we would love to hear from obviously the, your your esteemed professors but also very much the students if that's possible if with with the professor's permission of course um i think that we speak of the constitution in a time of flux for this country this nation even and we're doing it in a social and political context of foundational principles of the constitution um such as secularism uh, socialism that as we know was inserted later uh freedom of speech but also i think citizenship and equality being deeply challenged so what why do we value the constitution so much i think that there is a sort of privilege that is granted to law and to um the idea of law there's a huge normative weight to it but i think the constitution carries a very separate place in our minds and in our hearts and i think the reason is this that the rights that are guaranteed in the fundamental rights portion and let us be clear that that's only obviously one portion right like much of the constitution is actually dedicated to other things things like um how the state and the center will relate to each other how a unique how the union territory such as the union territory of delhi which is governed by both and there's a huge battle over it still um how it is to be governed that is governed by the constitution how um six schedule areas are to be mined how you know electoral disputes are to be resolved so the constitution governs lots of different things it's a codified social contract because there are many inherited social contracts in life and in social practice 
such as the practices of caste, the relationships between religious communities within religious communities, um, with individuals that are uh, uh, considered subaltern within those communities. And we see sort of relationships of, you know, women, disabled people, um, people of so-called lower caste sort of navigating these in different ways um, and various cultures and communities between each other. But this is not the codified social contract, right? The codified social contract that we have all agreed to um, to live together under is really the constitution of India. <clears throat> and this codified agreement ensures in chapter three in the section on fundamental rights that everyone has the right to equality, to dignity and to the credit to the, of the Supreme Court, the way article 21 has been interpreted, the right to a decent life. The reason I value the constitution so much is not merely because it is a codified social contract though, right? Because I think that if you say to a lawyer that, um, or even a law student maybe, that this is the law, then we know better than anyone else that laws can be good and laws can be bad, right? The constitution, as I've been saying, is on a different threshold, is, is, is at a different level. And what it does right now is that it recognizes and enshrines in a very um, deep and serious way, the natural rights that we are born with, the rights that cannot be taken away, regardless of what any law says, regardless even of whether our constitution is changed. There is an interpretation of this and how this is to be interpreted. Uh, there are the three judges cases and the basic, basic structure of the constitution, which you will study um, if you haven't looked at it already. And even that is important, but I don't even think that, I think that there is beyond that, the rights that we all agree to as a people. And those are in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and uh, those are um, in the ICCPR, those are in our constitution, those are in fact common to our constitution and many other constitution, but our rights are prior to those and more basic than that. What are those rights? Those rights are in more conceptual terms, the right to equality, the right to dignity, the right to a decent life. What does that mean? That means the right to adequate means of life. It's been specifically interpreted here um, in various judgments, and we will come, we will, we will discuss those. But in the abstract, that's what uh, our rights are. I think the onus on us all is in particular today is to make the leap into the imagination of full and complete citizenship that the founders of our constitution required of us. And in those imaginations, fill the idea of citizenship with the specificities and the range and variety of color, shape, and splendor. At the moment, I am before uh, the Delhi High Court and we're looking at queer marriage. There is, a, Amal is with us, she's interning with us right now. Um, and I think she has, she has also been assisting a bit on the case. Um, <clears throat> what we are doing in that case is, in addition to obviously asking that um, people of the same sex 
we their their marriages be recognized and their marriages be permitted we're doing more than that what we are seeking is that we are seeking that queer marriage be recognized now what is queerness queerness and that actually my um friends uh, and leaders of the queer com communities have really helped my thinking of citizenship in general some of it derives from foucault if you're interested but what queerness is is a recognition that we do not have identities that are fixed is that our sexuality our gender identity um also our biological sex actually and this is something that i only discovered in uh, in greater detail uh you know a few years ago is on a spectrum right i think that while that is an important value to understand in and of itself and very important actually because i think it frees us all whether we are men or women or trans people or anyone from the requirement of fitting into any given box you know even if it's the box of a hijra to be to, to free ourselves from those boxes um it opens up the ideas of very basic and simple rights like paternity leave the right to be involved as a father in a family um but in addition i think it in provides a very important heuristic a way of thinking about self and a way of thinking about citizenship um rohit vemula said in very ringing terms that he had written in his final note a man's value is reduced to his immediate identity but man should be treated as a mind as a glorious thing made up of stardust and he of course was speaking in a very particular context but his words have very universal resonance i think and that as citizens for better or for worse our constitution made makers made particular choices made the choice of emphasizing individual rights uh to an extent over group rights although our constitution also recognizes group rights i think individual rights have primacy and that primacy gives us the freedom the liberty to be who we are rather than to be um frozen and reified into particular categories now who we are may have different markers you know um i may not want to be recognized at all times as a woman for example i mean happily nobody calls me a woman lawyer well that's not true sometimes people call me a woman lawyer um but i while i frequently think the word woman there is redundant i also think at different times in different contexts that it's important to recognize that um our representation as a gender in the legal system is abysmal and that that representation is much greater so therefore to recognize for example that article 15 is growing in its recognition of horizontal rights in the fact that you cannot be discriminated against by shops or establishments on the basis of for example sex and that nalsa now says that sex is not biological sex sex is gender and the supreme court now is poised possibly to look again at the uh, zoroastrian society judgment about discrimination in housing and to say that you can't have housing discrimination that is important in anuj garg the supreme court brought in the idea of strict scrutiny 
when there is a law that is appearing to be beneficial to particular groups. In that case, I think it was the Punjab Excise Act that was being challenged and they said that um, in bars, people of a particular age could not work, but women you know, in particular were re restricted even more. Um, and they said no, you know, that when something looks paternalistic or beneficial, but discriminates against one particular uh, group over another, then Article 14 in and of itself, you don't even need to go to Article 15, right? They did, of course, examine Article 15 and take that jurisprudence forward, but that Article 14 requires the kind of examination where you look at the impact of such paternalism. You look at whether the intelligible differentia has, is in fact, relevant intel intelligible differentia in the context of the particular goals of the law that it seeks to, to um, serve. Whether there is any rational nexus between the differentia and the goal, right? You see various judgments, in fact, we're dealing with one now. You see various judgments where a less rigorous approach is taken to Article 14. And in fact, we have a we have a judgment we're looking at now, uh, an old judgment from the um, Gujarat High Court that basically says that, look, these are different classes, so it fulfills Article 14. I mean, obviously, you know, we know that that's not true, right? So there is a rigor with which we have these abstract notions in law interpreted from those natural rights into the constitution and then into much more concrete terms, still somewhat abstract by the Supreme Court in the particular case, of course, where there is justice, that's much more concrete, but in terms of general principles, more abstract. I would recommend that whenever you're feeling, um, you know, a bit down and out about things that Pick a, pick a judgment to read. Maybe, maybe we should all sort of crowdsource and even just here, write down judgments that inspires, inspire us. And in the Q&A session, maybe we could do that. We could have about five minutes where just people quickly, quickly write down the judgments that inspire. And you, would, you might be surprised at how many there are. When I was uh, uh, doing final arguments in the marital rape case, of course, we're going to have to start again now. Um, but I was so heartened to find a range of judgments which taken together should right now, if, you know, just without doing much work and taking them forward even, um, strike down the exception to section 375. I think also the reason that the constitution is important and these rights are important is because when we look at everyday life, right? Um, If we use that framework, then the CRPC takes on a different significance. The many of our everyday rights with reference to law and order are with are in the CRPC. Of course, there's the NDPS and other laws also, but mainly they're in the uh, CRPC, also the IPC, the IPC of course, but very much also the CRPC. Right. Um, <clears throat> in everyday life, for example, there was a case that I'd argued last year in MC Mehta and the Union of India, and it was a planning case. It was uh, around regulatory laws uh, surrounding unauthorized constructions. And the law said various things. Uh, basically, a committee had been brought in to decide what will be demolished, what will not, et cetera, right? Um, and something felt wrong to me. And this is why I always say that never 
it's tempting to specialize in one area because life becomes much easier because then you can just look at you know all the you know if you're looking at um, uh, indirect taxation you know all the board circulars you just have to do a little bit of extra work and that expertise can help in you know transferring from one case to the other right but in this case for example um that instinct that something was wrong uh bore fruit because what we we made arguments on article 300a on the of the constitution arguing that particular regulatory laws amount to expropriation of property if even if the owner of the property has transgressed the law to some degree that the expropriation demol demolition of the property for example cannot be done unless it is by law and a law means a statute a law is not supreme court order here a law is a statute right and that was one of the arguments that took us through um uh, before a, a a bench that wasn't easy before justice arun mishra and others um and we succeeded for those clients now there are many judgments that are ringing of various conceptions of equality liberty and justice and the rights that we fight for today are in many ways much more basic and immediate right so the right not to be discriminated against in housing which i spoke of earlier is being considered by um uh or has been considered by the supreme court and a bench of justice chandrachur and justice bopanna in the supreme court recently dismissed the appeal of a cooperative society against the order of uh the bombay high court that granted membership rights to the respondents now the bench said that it's not permissible it's impermissible that cooperative societies are denying membership to single women to individuals who are members of a particular community to persons who eat some particular food now this is of course it happens everywhere but it's particularly rampant in in bombay the respondents were not being given membership due to a dispute with the society over the use of open space now the high court said that um you can't under that section 232 of the maharashtra cooperative societies act cannot deny membership to a person who had appropriately uh, adhered to the rules had applied for membership to the society and this is punam cooperative housing society limited versus alok agarwal and others the reason i'm giving you um and you know ask me for for the citation if anyone can't find it the it's slp number 1122 of 2020 now the reason that i'm giving you the citations of these judgments is because i think that in everyday life look whether it's against the police whether it's in our relationships with each other the reason that we even win at legal notices stage legal notice stages of particular disputes not all disputes but some disputes right is because of the normative value of the law because you say that look this is the way things are supposed to be done one and two here is the potential um prohibition or ideally penalty that will come if you violate these rights remember also that in writ petitions for violation of rights there is now a larger and larger tradition of damages it's not sufficient and it's not widespread enough but and this is an area that we are working on and i think that it's a area to expand the law on for example in the jija ghosh case i was representing the institution adapt that uh, uh as uh, institution for disabled people that she was flying to in order to give a lecture and give policy advice and she was taken off the flight by spice jet uh because she was drooling it's a very normal thing to do if you have cerebral palsy and they said that she wasn't capable of flying they took her off the flight forcibly and it was extremely humiliating and of course the the country lost out to some uh, to some extent because she was not able to give her policy advice now she's somebody who's received the president's medal etc for um 
for her achievements. The one of the things that I was very much focused on was the fact of damages, because I think that compensation, it's not just the right, it's not enough to just establish a right. It's not enough to just establish that the state was wrong or the company was wrong. It's important to bring, yes, it's important to bring larger change for future generations, for people, for other people who, who are current fellow citizens. But it's also extremely important to address the sense of wrongdoing and the compensation for the mental agony, for the pain and suffering, for the sheer hassle that the petitioner had to go through. And also to provide a deterrent to the discriminating organization, to the discriminating entity, whether there is an individual and that in particular circumstances nowadays, it is an individual who is um, breaking all laws and therefore actually kidnapping a person if they're arresting them um, wrongly and that state sanction must be given. And if it's not being given, it can be challenged. That can be challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, disciplinary action can be taken by the, uh, by, the, by the state and must be taken by the state in such cases. Um, but yes, it's, it's frequently also just governments as an entity and um, companies. If one is being threatened, one has a right to police protection. There was a recent case before the Madras High Court where the court directed police protection to a member of the LGBTQIA plus community against frequent life threats from her family members who may have resorted to honor killing or uh, subjected her to physical harm. Um, I think there, that one always has to assess whether uh, in what way one seeks that police protection because one has to make sure that it doesn't kind of um, backfire, that doesn't boomerang against one. But in the law, in X versus state of Tamil Nadu, uh, criminal OP number 10880 of 2021, Justice Nirmal Kumar set out very, very concrete ways in which police protection must be granted. If they don't show up, what do you do? Um, and I think that nitty gritty provision of rights is really quite useful. The right to life, the most basic right to life and the right to protection of life. The Zakia Esan Jafri is the wife of Esan Jafri who was killed in the Gulbarg Society massacre in the Gujarat riots of 20, uh, 2002. Along with the Citizens for Justice and Peace, she moved to the Supreme Court, challenging the closure report filed by the SO, uh, SIT, which exonerated the state leaders who were allegedly part of the Gujarat riots conspiracy. And they had uh, cited the lack of investigation in the matter by ignoring crucial evidence. The case is ongoing. The bench will hear the matter on 1st December. This is SLP criminal 34207 of 2018. And this is, you know, it's being reported on live law. It isn't being reported. Uh, it's being reported on live law on Baron bench, but it's not really being reported much by the general media. So it takes a bit of looking, but it's very easy to find. Also, let's be clear that the biased TV reporting against Sista Setelvad was penalized by the Broadcasting Services um, governing panel, the NBSA. Um, and they said that it wasn't fair, that the way that they had reported on Sista Setelvad, who is uh, the leader of Citizens of Justice and Peace, was not, was not correct. So these aren't easy times. In fact, these are incredibly difficult times. But this is why we practice. And this is when we are needed most. There are many who don't have the privilege of being able or in a position to create hope. And as lawyers, particularly in this time, I think it is practically in our job description to do that. Not false hope. I'm not saying that we must be Pollyannaish, but I'm saying that we must find the strategies, the means, the resilience within ourselves and do the work. I think it's important to remember that, and particularly in our darkest times, that there are sort of, there is justice being created even now. 
remember that and focus on that and find ways to expand that. I think there's something to learn from the communists and the victims of the Bhopal grass tragedy who uh, I represent in the Supreme Court, also the victims of the Delhi riots. The faith in the idea that the arc of the moral universe will bend towards justice. They keep, they keep faith in this every day, despite the adjournments, despite the court denying them decent health care, you know, in, sp in spite of the order that Sakshi was talking about, the order, very ringing and clear order that we won, um, they're not implementing the order. So in order to implement the order now, there's a series of tasks that, ha that have to happen. Um, they don't take up arms, they do dharnas, they stay in court, they file RTIs, and they keep the faith. It is in the end, the constitution, natural rights and human rights in general that recognize and bolster and fuel our full humanity. And I think it must also fuel the grit and the aspiration that we bring to our work every day to make those rights the many splendored and real thing that they were imagined to be. Thank you. Shall we take questions? Do we have, uh, do professors Majid and Guha want to say something? Yeah, thank you, uh, Karuna, for uh, uh, you know this beautiful enunciation of why constitution matters. I think you know we can take questions from the audience, but I have something in mind uh, regarding the court's role, the role of the judiciary, you know, in terms of what it's expected to do for the constitution. Right. Lately, we have been witnessing a trend, you know, where kind of, you know, we believe that the judiciary is not living up to those expectations. For example, the cases pending in the Supreme Court, you know from last two, three or four years, maybe, starting from the electoral bonds case, then to CAA, then to the case on Kashmir, say, for example, or then the cases on farm laws, maybe. Now, thankfully, the government has announced it, you know, to have them repealed, yes. right? So, so what's your understanding of, you know, this whole phenomena? Why is it so? Why is it this, you know, blatant, you know, court kind of, you know, giving leverage to government? Look, I think, I think that regardless of how you codify the separation of powers, it's, it's sometimes not going to work, right? And when it doesn't, then other modes of protest, like you can't just look at cases in isolation. You can't just look at a case in court by itself. So many of the cases that we do are uh, the, the sort of constitutional cases, obviously not the arbitration or the other commercial litigation that we do, um, is representing social movements, right? And so I think that that protest, that struggle has a very important place, particularly today. And even though it is being suppressed at a, in a way that is unprecedented, you know? So I think that when you are, um, when you have a case in court and it's not, for example, unfortunately the electoral bonds issue, which uh, Professor Majid probably knows is something I think that is one of the most, if not the most important case of our times, right? Um, and this, I think, is actually, interestingly, a gap in our um, constitution in some ways, because, and in liberal, not in our constitution as much as liberalism, you know, because liberalism speaks of individual rights. I think liberalism in many ways fails to take into account structures of power. And it's only when you take a step back and you look at structures of power, are you really able to see that even if people have individual rights, if you have corporates funding elections, you know, the incentive structures are such that the individual rights are going to be litigated and decided in a context that aren't going to be uh, furthering them in the way that they must be. Because the, the right to, um, 
equality with each other doesn't look at the right to the pie being bigger you know right um yeah professor guha did you want to say something yes yes uh, thank you karuna for this wonderful uh, discussion uh, particularly i like the discussion because you highlighted the normative aspects of the constitution so very quickly i want to highlight two points uh, these are basically observations not questions uh, you said that constitution is basically a social document and uh, kind of social fortified contract. social is yes, a fortified, fortified social fortified contract social yes. social document arising out of a social contract uh, now my kind of uh, observation on this is that the constitution constituent assembly which kind of drafted the constitution uh, that was constitution a uh, constituent assembly was kind of elected on the basis of a limited franchise it was not elected on the basis of a universal franchise so to what extent uh, constitu constitution can be called a codified social document arising out of a social contract because a substantial section of the society did not participate in that social contract uh, this is my one kind of uh, observation and the second observation is regarding regarding the identity issue you raised so you basically talked about a postmodernist position where you said that identities are not stable they are not fixed uh, they are kind of fluid uh, fluid identities so that's very interesting uh, that you highlighted this point uh, but uh, my point uh, in this regard is that that if you do not treat identities uh, as stable identities as fixed identities then how do you make policies because in order to make public policies you have to treat identities as even if not a completely fixed and stable identity but you have to have a concrete kind of uh, kind of category so that you can make policies on the basis of those identities for example you cannot have reservation if you do not treat scheduled caste to be a concrete identity so what is your kind of kind of uh, uh, observation or what is your view on this how do you kind of negotiate these two position one is a postmodern position and one is a position which a public policy expert would possibly take so what is your view on this thank you for this wonderful discussion two two interesting questions from uh, ayan right um okay so two very interesting questions i think one is that i think you have pointed to the problem in social contract theory in general right and the problem with social contract theory is that you accept the i mean hobbesian rousseau you know rousseau's you accept the fiction that social contract is universal it is a fiction as you correctly pointed out right yes so that it, it is it. not in no it's a fiction it's, it's a complete it's fiction it. right yes. i mean these are two subtly different things and i would say that it's uh, the, the what i just said um the second thing is that there's also the fiction that it's not of a separate generation that it's not inherited you know because it's not like you and i and uh shifta and shaista and amal and rehan um have sat together and been any part of these negotiations you know it's not our social contract um it's also the illusion that the channels of change are as effective and regular and this will feed into man's the man's to your next question that these social contracts can keep up in a way that is real that doesn't bow to majoritarianism and that reflects what all of the people in the uh imagined negotiation are bringing to the table right so i think that's true that that's where the social contract falls um at the moment though this is the best we've got and it's actually pretty good the interesting thing is that when baba saheb was looking at and i would read urge all of you to read the annihilation of caste because it's a uh, it's actually a very easy read it's very compelling it's a very easy read because of the and i am learning myself uh, about 
how to deconstruct as much of my own samarna privilege as i can and um grappling with grappling with that and so i didn't read the arundhati roy although i'm a, um a, i really respect and like her like her work other work uh didn't read the introduction because of the protest around it and i wanted to hear baba saheb's words from himself right and it's a great read it's a very easy read what strikes you when you read ambedkar is that dr ambedkar's writing is very lucid it's very compelling and it's very clear and it's very contemporary one of the things that i found was that his view of equality and gender was so interesting and particularly progressive for the time you know so i think that they it's not that there isn't work to be done i don't think that i think that we do need a much greater articulation of gender equality in our constitution for example right and that's not there so does that reflect the kind of social contract that i would want no but it does have the hangers the framework that we can fight our litigations on and hang many of our legislations on you know so i think the the imperfection of the social contract that is embodied in the constitution is is true but in my view the result that we have is a pretty good one the second question um about identity i think that one has to navigate in everything in context right that in one's personal life so for example i may be have particularly characteristics that are ascribed as male in court and in my family characteristics that are ascribed as female but also male both you know all together right um when we speak of policy policy should de- democracy cannot come once every 5 years because that is not democracy democracy is a way of living together democracy is not a is is not a label it's not a it's not the fact of elections you know it's not even the fact of free and fair elections i don't think that's adequate it's if you have enough of a cycle between the elected and the electors that is as continuous as possible and that continuity and that ongoing cyclical change where the elected challenge and critique and tell the tell the elected about the 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 good things and the bad things about the policies and the laws and the actions of the elected and the elected transform in response i think that is true democracy for that you need a free press and so the free press can tell the elected and can tell government that you have a you know a tb breakout in um somewhere or that you have women being sterilized in um i think it was madhya pradesh uh without you know without consent that you have uh rapes happening well, you know by members of the ruling party um in uh in bengal that you have lynchings and that they aren't being adequately prosecuted in uh, uh many states in uttar pradesh in rajasthan um you have to have the right to protest you have to have rtis and many more things that haven't even been imagined yet you know something like a social audit is a new burgeoning thing which i think is a, is useful 
in uh, Meghalaya, it's become, it's come into law. We are asking for social audits in COVID cases before the high court, you know, in the COVID, uh, 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 COVID policies that are being made in preparation for the third wave, right? Because right now what's happening is that the government is saying that, look, all these things, we're doing all these things and they're working very hard, I'm telling you. They're working very hard. But without understanding what went wrong, why did people not receive these services? Why even today are people not receiving these services? How are you going to know where is this democracy? So therefore, I think policy needs to continually evolve and that fluidity is required in policy, right? In response to shifts and uh, evolutions in individual identity. Does anyone else have comments, questions, want to share anything? Ma'am, we've got quite a few questions on uh, YouTube. So can we take them? Uh, on, uh, we prioritize the people who are actually here. Okay, all right, ma'am. There is a question in the chat box. Let me read it out for you. Uh, no, I would like the people to speak, the people who have the questions, if you would like. If you okay. would like, then I would like, like you to speak. You can raise your hand on the Zoom. Yeah, so if anyone has any question, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can then go ahead. Uh, ma'am? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question that uh, what's your standpoint on the commutation of death sentence in heinous crimes like rape cases or how will you relate it to the right to life as granted by our constitution? Is this uh, Vasifa? Am I saying it correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, also, as much as possible, I'd love to see your faces. If it's possible. I mean, if you're in pajamas, don't worry, bother. Um, You know, Vasifa, I've really traveled a journey in terms of rape cases, in terms of death sentences, right? Because instinctively, about, say, 20 years ago, I used to feel that, well, if somebody kills, you know, in a really brutal way, say, 200 people, let's take the easy example, in brutal way kills 200 people, including just very vulnerable people, then why should not they why should they not be killed themselves right and i think that there are various very clear arguments against that <coughs> and i traveled a journey in my thinking one is that is the instinctive normative clarity that the state brings that an individual does not bring right which is that you can't show that killing is wrong by killing. You know, so if the state kills in response, then how do you even say killing is wrong? Um, the second is that the Innocence Project in the United States and a very close friend of mine is, uh, is working with them. Um, there's lots of evidence to show that people who were sentenced to that death were actually innocent, didn't do anything, you know? And a death sentence is not something you can take back. So there was a case in with Justice um, M.B. Shah uh, that he was in and the bench was divided as to whether the person was innocent and guilty, innocent or guilty, and the person was sentenced to death, right? They weren't divided on whether he should be sentenced to death or not. They were divided on whether he was innocent or guilty. And in such a circumstance, and it was, I think it was only a two judge bench. Um, and so in such a circumstance, I don't see how you can do something that can't be taken back. Um, in addition, there's no evidence to show that the death penalty is a deterrent to killing. And there is some evidence to show from Georgia, for example, in uh, the United States, that the death penalty is, in fact, has a hardening effect. And there was an increase in violent crime um, in rape and in murder. You know? So, when you have politicians coming out and you know in the uh, in the anti rape laws that uh, i had contributed somewhat to the 
increase in the ambit of the death penalty, we're actually going, we were then really going against the tide where lots of countries were getting rid of it and reducing the ambit. We were going in the other direction and increasing the ambit, you know, um, particularly with the evidence laws in our country where they have been very hard fought and the evidence of the woman is valuable. So when you are saying that you get the same sentence if you rape the person or if you kill the person, you know, then frankly, what isn't there, aren't you increasing the incentive, even if it's just in theory, to kill the person? It's the easiest thing in the world to um, for politicians to come out and say, you know, right? Usko. Rather than to make sure that uh, the rape is prevented, prevent through this, and there are ways that it can do it. When you increase, for example, when you have uh, gender trainings and workshops from the time that a kid goes to preschool, right? Uh, to the time that the, uh, I mean, to sort of public, campaigns on these things. And it's not rocket science. We know what works, you know, um, to prevent violence against women, to have sort of, you know, interventions and programs and uh, to have swift and certain justice. Because if you think you might be sentenced to death 30 years later, versus you will be sentenced to prison for 10 years or 20 years or whatever it is, um, six months later or eight months later, the difference will be and that you will be caught immediately and that you will be sentenced then, right? The difference in your thinking will be dramatic, you know? Um, so when politicians come out and say, you know, death penalty, uh, you know, let sentence this person to death and we must strengthen our laws and we must, it's basically bloodlust in the name of women. And basically it's a very lazy position. It's a lazy politician speaking, you know? And it's a lazy politician who doesn't want to govern, who can't, who are, doesn't know either how to do their work or is unwilling to do their work. It leads to positions where you have people being um, killed without knowing where, that they are rapists or not, or whether uh, some real rapists are going free and some chaps have just been rounded up, right? So-called encounter killings where half the population is just, you know, mad with uh, uh, bloodlust and so happy that this has been done. And those very people very frequently will be sort of trolling women on Twitter and making rape threats, you know? And this is the irony, that overlap. Um, uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but that's why I'm against the death penalty. Yes, please, uh, Shifta. Uh, Tushar, I'm going to come different? to you and let you give your YouTube questions also. Okay. Sure. Let's just let everyone here do it first, because that's fair, right? These people have actually showed up. We can see them. Okay, so good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, ma'am, as you have said a few minutes ago that you have traveled a long way through these rape cases and all. And I have a bit personal question to you. Yeah, sure. Like after seeing these cases of heinous rapes and rape cases, how you feel and gather emotional courage as at the end of the day, you are a female advocate. Like you know, you that, also that's a really good question. Threats. No, no, I've, I've blocked them all. I've actually, I've blocked the entire IT cells. I've blocked like anyone who's even like annoying or like slightly boring. I just blocked them. And now my Twitter is a really good experience. It's a, it's a very happy, like there's no problem. Ma'am, <laughs> as we are on the way to be a female advocate, so please share yeah. your thoughts. Okay. Uh, so far, Shifta, I think I've been blessed with a certain amount of natural resilience. I don't want to put Nazar and take it away, but I think that's part of it, right? Um, but part of it is also that I think I step back and look at, I have, I, I have a keen eye on what is required to nourish myself and keep myself resilient, you know? 
and and have the understanding that i am not only my work you know and that nourishment may come from a little bit of reading it's it's really weird how a little bit of reading of fiction and how nourishing it is versus watching a show you know um and sort of the the stuff like meditation and exercise which i am only able to do intermi intermittently these days but meditation i have been able to do somewhat um nature has not been possible because i am locked into the house and not breathing the outside air right now um and i think we should take that opportunity i want to talk about that for one uh, for a couple of minutes i don't know how much time we have how much time do we have we still have some time i think we can take in you know, of some more questions okay maybe half um, an hour oh sure i mean yeah i oh god i think i have a meeting at 5 but yeah i have a meeting at 5 so we can wind up by 5 yeah okay um so yeah i think kind of making sure that you are well and that you are resilient is very important because otherwise you know the golden eggs are not going to come if you're the goose right and it's not just instrumental it's also just having a value and respect for oneself as a woman you know because very often we see ourselves as instrumental whether it's to a larger cause of justice whether it's to our families whether it's to anything else and that is i think it's very important for us to to kind of value ourselves put ourselves first as individuals you know even as mothers because if you don't do that like how are you going to be a good forget all that i think it's just important to have that respect and value for yourself um and to practice that to practice that every day and to to have someone to check in with for that um there's something that sort of came to mind you know and i think that it speaks of electoral bonds but i think that there's a really worrying trend of privatization of natural resources and when i speak of that i'm not speaking of iron or magnesium only i'm speaking of air you know i have the luxury of sitting inside here the air here is uh, i mean i look at my monitor obsessively the air here is sometimes 55 in this room it's sometimes 55 sometimes it's about 150 right aqi um i have a vulnerable person in the family and in the bedroom where they are the air is generally about 50 or below which is pretty good it's very good there's been a privatization therefore of breathing right when did that become okay there's been a privatization of information so that you know information that's easily publicly available is all propaganda there is of course a privatization of um natural resources there's been a privatization of elections you know through electoral bonds and we also have a privatization of grief through so many of us either lost people that we ourselves loved in the second wave in covid but also you know i have a colleague who who works in my chamber who's a parent and i don't want to go into the details uh, but whose parent passed away like in the car while our entire chamber was working to try and get a hospital and we got outside the hospital that was found he passed away in the car you know i was able before that to get two oxygen cylinders one through a mp who was helping through a very high level political contact that reached out to me and the second one other oxygen cylinder through the owners of a large delhi hotel is that what it takes to breathe you know and why is there no acknowledgement of that grief so that we can as a collective in delhi and nationally 
but in delhi i think there was a particular kind of carnage and trauma that we went through of course i'm sure this is also true in other parts of the country but then delhi gets so much attention you know um but it can't be spoken of and i think this is something that we have to to think of and to find uh ways to deal with whether it's through legal frameworks or whether it's without um so we have sarla and vidushi right now right uh who went i think vidushi was first is that correct yes ma'am yes, ma i okay. think vidushi can go ahead so with Vidu, vidushi why don't you come <clears throat> first and then i think we definitely should sarla i'm sorry uh what you can do is uh i'll leave my email and i mean funnily enough my phone number is online but my email is not um i'm leaving my email in the chat box don't deluge me with questions but i'll try and do what i can um so we do ship we go ahead and then actually what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh uh, uh we're going to take a couple of youtube questions because we can't get them out no right, good evening ma'am okay and so first of all it was great listening to you thank you thank and you. my question is ma'am what do you think like uh, compare the government to take down down the farm laws was it the power of protest or just the government's own interest electoral interest is part of democracy you know and protests do and should use it as strategy right use it as part of strategy so obviously the point is that and the thing is that the governments will often not respond to individual uh interests and individual rights which they should that's why you have the constitution which is meant to be a bulwark of individual rights against uh, uh majoritarianism and i'm not just saying majoritarianism in the way that everyone started speaking of today even if everyone agrees that the farm laws are good for example or if uh or if everybody agreed that um you know particular types of disability should be sort of hived off and uh, 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 people with mental illness should be hived off and placed in institutions and not in the general population for example right even if everyone agreed even there was a law on it this is why we have individual rights but in terms of larger protest that is how democracy is supposed to work that the government's going to be worried that there is such a protest we may lose and so therefore we'll change ideally they would say that look this bunch of people are our citizens we are governing them they don't feel it's right we're unhappy let us look at this again and see whether we got it wrong but they actually they represent everybody else because the msp only goes to a few people but uh, lots of people are aware of it you know and what that msp for example right so there's been a sort of the division between uh rich farmers and poor farmers therefore then collapsed in a way and um yeah so i don't think it's a binary ma'am just adding to that like asking sure. some more ma'am okay. but then what took them so quickly, long because we have the youtube video. yes ma'am but then yeah. what took them so long like only when the elections were near they realized that okay they are not the farmers are not going to agree we'll take it down so doesn't it make it, make it look like that it was just the elections I think that the state of position of government that uh separatist forces were also taking advantage of this I think there is also some truth to that because if you look at the um there was a referendum in London okay about whether there should be a Khalistan or not and I just could think of like how can you have a referendum in London you know it's a uh, and there was lots of jokes going around on twitter and i was saying you know i'll take me fair but i think there is some truth to that that khalistani forces that don't have uh that have very little traction in punjab but have much more significant traction in other places were looking to in in canada for instance and to some extent in england 
um, were looking to to intervene in terms of timing, and if that is the thing that uh, made them swing the elections. Again, I mean, I would have thought that they sh they should have done it before, but then they did it now. You know, which is doesn't take away from the fact that so many people died in the protest. It doesn't take away from the fact that. Um, there was a huge suppression of speech that happened, that there are criminal cases against large numbers of people that should not be there. That compensation should be given to everyone and a deep, deep apology for all of that, not just for the farm laws needs to come. It doesn't take away from the fact, I think that um, the, 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 the protest should stop, which is something that the farmers have said, we're not gonna stop the protest. We don't believe it, right? Until it's taken back, let it be taken back, then we'll see, right? Um, and we'll have a further discussion. So yeah, Tushar, let's let's meet the YouTube. Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, there was this question which said, uh, ma'am, hmm. we as students are starting out with our careers and are writing on topics or debating on prevailing issues, hmm. which is imperative for us. Hmm. Um, how does one at an institutional level mm. write or speak on such issues without falling into the anxiety of being charged with sedition, which, by the way, the case of declaring Section 124 of the Constitution is pending before the Supreme Court. But, uh, Section 124, the constitutional validity has been challenged. So what is your view on that? See, there's a huge, huge chilling effect these days. And I think everyone who, uh, I think that we must have solidarities across the board, right? And we must all have solidarities with each other uh, to prevent that from happening. The more that we speak our truths, the more the other person gets courage. Um, I think you can have a group of like-minded people to assess the real possibility because it's, it's not all, you know, the fear might be overblown and the fear might be accurate, right? Given what your circumstances are. So I think what you should do is have little groups and discuss uh, the accuracy and the non-accuracy of the fear and then take your own decisions because everyone has different circumstances. I'm sorry if that's a bit of a depressing answer. Ma'am, actually, we have two raised hands here. So if it's fine, we can just take those two and we can then end, end the meeting. Okay, you're giving up your YouTubers. It's like we don't have many questions there, so we can uh, take these two up right now because they are in the meeting, as you said. Okay, so uh, we'll go with uh, Rehan and Shaista. Rehan, please uh, speak. Put your video on if you can. Hello. Uh, hello, ma'am. This is Rehan Ghaleb. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question related with the previous one, one. just adding few flavor on it. Uh, Ma'am, the Criminal Amendment uh, Act 2013 made rape punishment more rigid, adding POSCO over it. So in the last few years, nation witnessed more victim. So what's your uh, stand on it, Ma'am? Is it a more uh, um, alert position for us? Or do we really need to um, look on the Criminal Amendment Act? No, I think that... Uh... Um, I think there are lots of amendments that need to happen to our criminal laws. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that the current process of overhauling our criminal laws is promising, um, but But uh, I do think the criminal laws need to be overhauled, you know, in the direction perhaps that you speak of to, to a degree. Shaisa? No, thank you, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, Shaisa. Ma'am, I want to know what was your journey from a law student to an advocate? We can know this from the Google also, but by hearing uh, from you is a different thing. And did you have given any sacrifices or something like that? It will be very helpful for us in our journey. I'm exhausted all the time. <laughs> I don't know if that's 
Uh, that's a, that is a bit of a sacrifice, I guess. Um, I don't think one should be. I think one should manage one's time so one has, um, you know. And it's this is a recent phenomenon. Uh, my journey as a law student. Now it's been a while, Shaista. Now you want me to go through twenty over, you know, twenty years in the like few seconds that we had. There are things that I dreamt of as a law student that. Yeah. There are things that. Uh, thank you, Tosif. There are things that we. I dreamt of as a law student that we are. Uh, that I'm still doing, right? I dreamt of doing rights cases. I was clear that I needed to support myself and family, um, and I also have an economics degree, and I was interested in that. So. I do commercial cases. Um, I'm interested by my work, and it still stimulates and inspires me. Though that sometimes takes work itself in itself, and I'm very glad and grateful for that. Uh, litigation, at some point, many of us become our own boss, and you have the pressures of that because you have to run a practice and you have to, you know, pay people and pay, you know, either buy a place or pay rent or whatever, you have to manage a space. So there's that aspect of life, which is, you know, rarely spoken of. And I really think professors that your law schools should teach that. I really, really think so, you know. Um, but it also provides you a level of flexibility when you need it, because there isn't someone sitting on your head and saying, Nokri chali jayegi, right? Um, so that's helpful. And when it comes to family care, and that burden is disproportionately mm -hmm. on women, uh, that can be something that's, that's quite helpful. Okay, we'll take one last question, and then we'll end it. Safia? Safia? Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, Safia. Shivangi, I'm so sorry, we're out of time. Uh, ma'am, my Email question me. is that, yeah. uh, ma'am, like in Priyanka Reddy case, uh, like all uh, all the culprit uh, were shooted by the police, uh, yeah. even without any trial, and we don't know that they are a real culprit or not. So, ma'am, what do you think about it's a violation of a constitution or it's a violation of a right to right to freedom? Uh... Can you see my email now, folks? It's a direct message. I can't, how do I get out of the direct messages? It's a violation of the right to life. You can't just go and execute people, right? It's a violation of everything. Um, it's the violation of women's rights not to be raped because how do you know that it's the correct person or whether it's the pressure I mean, the woman was being assaulted some few meters away from where the police was, you know, and it took a, an inordinate, uh, inordinate amount of time to, to get these people. Um, so, frankly, in this circumstance, to then suddenly go and sort of kill these people makes very little sense in any direction, you know. Uh, we're going to end here. My email is karuna.nandi. Sir, I think. And then sir can circulate amongst everyone. No, that I'll just tell everyone. It's easier. Okay. Karuna.nandi, N-U-N-D-Y, at nandichambers.com. I will do it. I'll do it, Karuna. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So give us two. Uh, yeah. Give us two minutes, sir. Tushar will do a wind up formally. All right. <laughs> if you have. <laughs> uh, so we would just like to invite Aisha to deliver the vote of thanks. Yeah. A very good evening to all. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this event to all present here. On behalf of Constitutional Law Club. 
Hill Sir, School of Law, Jamia Hamdan, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Advocate Karuna Nandi for taking out her precious time and sharing her knowledge and expertise. The lecture was indeed informative. I would like to thank Professor Dr. Afshar Alam, Honorable Vice Chancellor Jamia Hamdad, and Professor Dr. Salina Bashir, Dean, School of Law, for their commitment and consistent support to organize events such as these. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Burhan Majid, sir, faculty convener of Constitutional Law Club, for putting his best to organize events such as these. I would, like, I would also like to thank the student organizers of the event, Sakshi Batra, uh, sorry, Sakshi Singh and Tushar Batra, who put their considerable time and effort in the event. Last but not the least, a special thanks to all the participants for their active participation. Once again, I thank one and all present here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aisha. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.